Joining us now for more from Beijing, Shindo Xu is a political analyst for China Radio International. With us here in the studio, John Sitalides is a global risk analyst and U.S. government affairs consultant. From London, Alexander Nekrasov is a former advisor to the Russian government, and Edmund Garib is a scholar and a specialist on the media and Middle East affairs. Thanks to all of you. John, let me start with you. John, um, President Trump has been in office for a little less than a year, as we've pointed out. What does the balance sheet look like? And you know, we have to remember that some people may call it accomplishments, others might, others might say they're setbacks. Clearly a very unconventional president who campaigned as a disruptive leader and has carried out that disruption to a certain degree, but in many aspects, Anand, I think you also see a rather conventional foreign policy from President Trump. All of the highlights that your correspondent pointed out were, for the most part, fulfillments of campaign promises in 2015 and 2016, except he didn't actually tear up the Iran nuclear agreement. And they probably won't. I think what you'll see there is very strict enforcement in a way that the Obama administration chose not to. But in most areas, U.S.-Asia relations, our relations with European Union countries, with Russia, and on national security issues more broadly, there hasn't been that much of a change except for the desire, based on the pronouncement, to renegotiate trade agreements that candidate Trump felt were very bad for American workers and the American economy. Well, the relationship with Asia. Let's go to Shindo Xu in Beijing for his view on that. Shindo, how would you characterize Trump's relationship with China? I mean, it seemed to blow hot and cold at times. At times, uh, he commended China. He called President Xi Jinping a partner. At other times, he was very critical uh, of China. How does China see this? Well, I think, you know, uh, for China, people still see uh, there's uncertainty, is not 100% sure of uh, what the President uh, Trump represents. On one hand, you do see his uh, strong relationship uh, with uh, his counterpart, you know, Xi Jinping. On the other hand, you do see uh, he has some tough rhetoric uh, on China. But mostly, I think the Chinese people are looking at not only at his rhetoric, but also you know, what kind of action he's, he has taken or he's going to take against China on many fronts. Edmund, President Trump made his first trip to the Middle East in 2017. He's been fully supportive of the Saudi government. Uh, as we've heard, he's threatened to undo the Iranian nuclear deal. And uh, towards the end of the year, he recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, angering not just Palestinians, but many other people in the Arab world as well. What kind of mark did he leave on the Middle East? Well, there's no doubt there's a mixed uh, kind of message that he has sent. Uh, on the one hand, as you mentioned, he has improved his relations uh, with the Saudis. There's an improved relationship with the UAE. Uh, at the same time, when he went to visit Riyadh, there were uh, leaders of uh, more than 50 Muslim countries who attended that, uh, that meeting. Uh, nevertheless, uh, his policy has raised a lot of questions about uh, the U.S. position in the region, and particularly more recently, the most recent issue has been Jerusalem. I mean, what we are seeing here, almost it's a, like a repetition of the Balfour Declaration, where you have a, a foreign leader giving something that doesn't belong to him to someone who has no right to it. And then this, when he recognizes that Jerusalem is the capital of, uh, of Israel, uh, he almost uh, diverts also from something like 70 years of U.S. foreign policy. During the election campaign, he said that he supports Israel. He's a strong supporter of Israel. But he said, if we are, we are to play the role of mediators, we have to t adopt an independent, neutral position. And yet, he seems to be taking sides. Uh, that will have a lot of consequences. How significant is that, the fact that he's now seen as someone who's uh, not neutral? I think it's very significant for uh, many people in the region because there were many, including um, some in the Gulf and other parts, who looked at President Obama as someone uh, who was not, did not understand the issues in the region. Part of it had to do with Iran, right. the concern about Iranian influence in the region. Mm -hmm. But right now, this position, taking this stand, raises a lot of question about the credibility of the United States and about the ability of the U.S. to play the role of the mediator, of the peace facilitator, because the U.S. has been saying for the last 30 to 40 years yeah. that we are the only ones who can do, who can play this role yeah. of uh, mediator. Uh, but in fact, uh, now this raises question about that role, about the legitimacy and the ability of the U.S. to play the role of the mediator. 
Okay, let's go to Alexander in London. And Alexander, if there has been any foreign nation that's been more central to domestic American politics in 2017, it has been Russia. Accusations every day, so far largely unproven, that Russia meddled in the U.S. presidential election. Uh, President Putin, however, has said that he wants better relations with the United States. Let's take a listen to what the Russian leader had to say. I do hope he wants to improve relations with Russia. And in the end, it is in the interest of the American people and the Russian people. And I do hope that we'll normalize our relations, we'll develop together, we'll overcome joint threats, which are well known, such as terrorism, addressing environmental affairs, fighting the spread of weapons of mass destruction, the overcoming of crises in different regions of the world, including the Middle East, the issue of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. There are many things we can address far more efficiently if we pool our efforts together. So, Alexander, uh, as we just heard there, President Putin wants to work with the United States, but as we've also heard, there are elements within the United States who uh, would like probably a return to the Cold War. What do you make of the past year and the prospects for the year ahead? Well, first of all, I'd like to stress that the Kremlin's position towards the U.S. and Trump specifically is uh, that of pragmatism. Trump is a politician, uh, as I spoke to some of the Russian officials, whom they treat uh, in a way that uh, his mouth sometimes doesn't connect to his eyes, and um, uh, meaning that he says something but doesn't really mean it. And uh, when it comes to Russia, that's the sort of signals he's been sending to the Kremlin. When he publicly basically attacks Russia and calls it um, an aggressor and so on, he, he, you know, in, in the Kremlin, the feeling is he doesn't really mean it because he has to say it because he's under pressure in Washington. And uh, I think that uh, Putin's uh, <coughs> latest comments about the relations with Washington, I think they prove that Russia is waiting for some sort of a change. I think the same applies in a certain way to China as well. I think the Chinese are practical, pragmatic people, and they also treat some of his statements well, not with a pinch of salt, but, you know, with pragmatism. And I think that the greatest achievement of Trump's uh, uh, first, uh, well, nearly first year in office, that we didn't really see any serious conflicts erupting anywhere, uh, as some of the experts were predicting. And I think even in the Middle East, where there was a lot of, um, I would say, fears that he might cause a lot of problems. I think the only serious problem that Trump caused there is, uh, is the Saudi Arabian so-called corruption battle, uh, fight with corruption. I, th I think that can misfire badly on America and on the whole region. And I think that a lot of people have probably missed what's really going on in Saudi Arabia. But generally, I don't think that, you know, apart from his statements on North Korea, which some treated as a, a possible, you know, opening to a nuclear war, I think across the world he's been quite restrained. And, and I think a lot of um, probably uh, a lot of be, uh, sort of uh, 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 thanks to that mm -hmm. should be on Rex Tillerson, because I think Rex Tillerson has been the calming factor in Washington and on Trump himself. Or... Maybe they're playing a game, of course, and Rex Tillerson is the good cop, and sometimes the president is the bad cop. But on, on, on the whole, the first year in office, no, no big uh, upheavals in, in foreign policy. John, has President Trump been the picture of restraint? Others would say that he's caused a lot of problems with the America First policy, strained relations with allies in Europe, strained relations with China. No, as a matter of fact, there have been certain areas where there have been some type of new problems, but I think for the most part, as I said earlier, uh, a rather unconventional politician with a largely conventional foreign policy, even where there are major issues now between the U.S. and China. China and Russia are now emerging powers on the world stage in a way that they simply weren't 10 and 15 years ago. The U.S. has never really come up with a post-Cold War strategy for its dealings with the world. It's really been catch-as-catch-can based on different developments in the 90s and especially after 9-11. What we have right now is the acceptance of China and Russia as strategic rivals on the world stage. But even with China, where you have problems in the South China Sea, with Japan over the Senkaku Islands, and with the North Korea issue, 
President Trump is looking to balance our strategic issues in the Western Pacific with even a scaling back of a lot of the anti-trade rhetoric that we saw regarding China potentially as a currency manipulator. So he's been able to balance that in ways where we're looking to get Xi Jinping's help, say, to defuse the North Korea issue. And I also think that one of the areas that Vladimir Putin was speaking about as a potential area of U.S.-Russia cooperation is North Korea. Russia is the one party that almost never talks about with great influence in Pyongyang. And I think in addition to all of the problems that we have with Russia in Syria and in Ukraine and elsewhere in Europe, one area for great potential uh, collaboration is in North Korea. Shinda, what do you make of that? Uh, President Trump has criticized China, but he's also, has, has he also recognized China is needed to resolve some problems like the North Korean uh, or the DPRK nuclear problem? Uh, other issues in the world, in the Middle East as well? Well, absolutely. You know, that's why in this NSS report about the U.S. vision of strategy, you know, in, uh, toward the world, including China, uh, you know, the U.S. views China and Russia as a rival, as competitor. But then, you know, it's a bit of confusion here. It's not uh, entirely clear. If you view China as competitor, you know, what does that mean? Uh, does, does that mean the two countries com are competing on every issue? Uh, as we know, as we point out, in many of the international issues, China and the United States are cooperating with each other. And uh, there's a need for them to, co to cooperate with each other to solve this problem, like on the issues on the Iranian a nuclear issue on the North Korean nuclear <coughs> issue. I mean, China's participation is critical, is, uh, is absolute uh, in need. Uh, China's cooperation with South Korea and China, Russia, obviously, they play a very important role in whatever scenario on the Korean Peninsula in the new year. Edmund, let's take a look at some of the big security issues for President Trump in the Middle East. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. Terrorism has spread all across the world. But the path to peace begins right here on this ancient soil in this sacred land. America is prepared to stand with you in pursuit of shared interests and common security. But the nations of the Middle East cannot wait for American power to crush this enemy for them. Would it be fair to say, Edmund, that on an issue like Syria, for instance, that the United States under President Trump has taken a back seat? We've seen President Putin of Russia actually take the initiative. He traveled to Syria, the Syrian leader traveled to Russia, and they've got a, a, a settlement right now. So do you see the United States withdrawing more from the, United, from the Middle East? I don't think the, the United States is withdrawing. I think there is a different and a new strategy that was, and new tactics that uh, were adopted. The United States under President Obama, uh, because President Obama was the man who was elected because he was opposed to the Iraq war. He was opposed to intervention. He did not want to intervene directly. What we saw, in fact, is the U.S. was intervening through its allies uh, in the region. In fact, the U.S. continued to support also uh, financially as well as some training uh, to opposition groups in Syria. And in fact, some of that is still going on today. And we hear that uh, we now know that there are uh, more troops, more American troops, four times more than what had been publicly uh, announced. Uh, also, pre however, President Trump, I think, did something else. Uh, during the campaign, he was talking about let Daesh and Assad fight each other. They are both opponents. Then sometimes you say, we need to fight Daesh, ISIS, because ISIS poses the main threat. And, uh, you know, Assad is not as important now. And let, Leave it to the Russians. So basically, there is this dichotomy, there is this contradiction sometimes. There's one policy, we hear one thing one day, then we see and hear something else uh, the next day. And this has been one, I think, of the main problems that's facing uh, the U.S. in the region. And now I think uh, what we, the U.S. has played one important role. They have helped defeat ISIS to a large extent right. in uh, Iraq to a lesser extent in Syria and Raqqa, for example, uh, but at the same time, uh, where are we going from here? The U.S. still maintaining troops in Syria, uh, and these troops uh, are not recognized on by either or not given uh, legitimacy either by the United Nations Security Council or by the Syrian government, which is the legitimate government. And that raises question about the future relationship, not only with Syria, right. with Turkey, with Russia. Okay. John, has the United States had a problem here articulating a clear policy in Syria? Because on the one hand, what we heard very often was Assad has to go, but we never heard 
Who replaces him? Well, Assad has to go was President Obama's mantra, mm -hmm. and one that he utterly failed to deliver on for, with obvious consequences. A half a million people killed and millions of displaced refugees in the area and in, in Europe. I think the Trump administration made a very calculated decision, Anand, that Syria is not going to be a major factor in American foreign policy. It was largely relegated to Russia. The U.S. Uh, obligation there was to help defeat the Islamic State, working with the Kurds, working with our Sunni Arab allies in the region to destroy the so-called caliphate of the Islamic State. But Syria by itself is not a strategic issue for the United States. What is, is Iran. And that's, I think, where you're going to see a concentrated U.S. foreign policy. As we noted earlier, we saw that President Trump has basically placed his bets on the Saudis and other Sunni allies, the United Arab Emirates and Jordan, who, by the way, are much more concerned with working with Israel to try to contain Iran and make sure Iran does not establish a land bridge to the Mediterranean coast and to Lebanon than they seem to be concerned about the Israeli-Palestinian issue or even the Jerusalem capital announcement. Iran, I think, is going to be the major focus of U.S. Middle Eastern policy in 2018. Okay. Uh, Alexander, what did you make of President Putin's uh, military involvement and his diplomacy in Syria? Did it send the message that Russia uh, is still a major international player? Well, on the one hand, it obviously did send a message that Russia is prepared to be involved in uh, uh, solutions of crises uh, around the world and in the Middle East as well. But I think the problem is that um, there, uh, although we have uh, several plans and uh, allegedly there is some sort of a solution uh, for Syria, I don't think that the Syrian problem will be resolved quickly. I don't think anybody in the Kremlin now thinks that this is a done deal, although uh, officially they're saying mission accomplished, meaning that the Russian troops have performed well and that Daesh is basically... Uh, has to had to retreat, but unfortunately, I think this problem will continue. And I think one of the reasons why the Trump administration seems to be distancing itself from Syria is because they understand that Russia in Syria has a problem. It doesn't have a solution, a quick fix, and that's why they don't want to be dragged into this. They are sort of sitting by the sidelines and looking what the Russians will do there. So on this uh, occasion, I have to agree that Syria is not really a priority and, and Iran is a much bigger priority. Also, I think the Israelis, the, the Americans have given the Israelis quite a big role to play in the Middle East. And we see that they are basically involved now with lots of countries that previously you would never dream of mm. seeing Israelis do, dealing with, including Saudi Arabia. So... Um, I, I, I think that, uh, again, Russia has a pragmatic view now. I think that they are taking every event as it comes, and I don't think they see a big solution coming. But the thing is to remember that the main issue is still Ukraine. And what has been a good sign for Russia is that Trump did not really deliver uh, what everybody was afraid of in Moscow, that is uh, supplying lethal weapons in a big way to the Ukrainian government. That would have been a major, major cause of problems for Moscow, for the Kremlin, and especially for Putin, who is running for president in a few months' time, uh, for another term. And so in this respect, I think if we look at, at, at the Ukrainian crisis and the role of America there, I think it is actually, actually not a bad development for Moscow, and um, there might be even some sort of a solution on the horizon, not quickly, not this year, not in 2018, but maybe in 2019, 2020. Okay. John, uh, talking about President Trump, I have to talk about his style of government. He brought something very new uh, to the presidency. Some might call it a 21st century way of communicating, and that is using Twitter, tweeting, some, in some cases, his policies. Um, those who support his use of Twitter say, well, you know what, he gets around a media that is very hostile to him, to directly to his supporters. Uh, but using Twitter and sending out these tweets, some, most of them very early in the morning, has it worked for him? I think it's worked for him on domestic policy issues. He clearly is facing the most hostile media wall that any president in modern history has had to deal with, including Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon, for that matter. But I do think it causes unnecessary complications on the world stage. I think 
you know, to the extent that a president's communication strategy should be based on reassuring allies and keeping our foes and our rivals at bay. I think there's been too many mixed messages, uh, say on North Korea, where Rex Tillerson will pronounce one strategy and he'll be denounced immediately by his boss, President Trump, several hours later on Twitter. We've seen those mixed messages on other issues as well. But this is who he is. There's nothing that can be done about that. And even his family members who've tried to restrain him on the Twitter use are unable to do so. So I think as one of the other guests mentioned earlier, what's more important than what he tweets is what the United States actually does. And I think on that front, he's largely lived up to what he had said he would do. There have been a couple of twists, and there will likely be much more in 2018. I don't think the Twitter really is involved in that so much because the actions speak much louder than words, as in any other case. Uh, Shindo, if we look at the relationship between President Trump and President Xi Jinping, I mean, they differ uh, quite a bit on two big issues. That is globalization, and the other is climate change. You hear China championing globalization uh, and the climate change agreement in Paris. Uh, President Trump has very different views on that. What is the outlook for 2018? Do you think there'd be more of a meeting of minds on these issues? Well, obviously, they have different ideas. I don't think that we agree upon uh, those ideas, globalization and climate change in the new year. Obviously, you know, uh, 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 President Trump is following his American first principle, sometimes at the expense of, uh, you know, like relationship uh, with other countries, including allies, but that's his style. And for China, you know, uh, people do see and uh, do truly believe that the globalization is something that you cannot unwind because it has been going on for decades. And the China and Chinese people do believe that, uh, you know, people can benefit from globalization, from investment from other countries and also infrastructure construction. Uh, because that's the Chinese experience. And obviously, they are sharing this experience with countries along this Belt and Road Initiative. And when it comes to climate change, you know, there's no real debate in China. Basically, everybody agrees, yes, we should do something, partly because of serious, uh, you know, pollution, air, water, pollution in China, in the Chinese capital cities. So people say, hey, we have this enough, you know, enough is enough. Let's do something. So that's in line with uh, the overall global fight against the climate change. So people basically welcome the measures you know, taken by the government in terms of the renewable energy, mm -hmm. green energy, right. and the tough measures on, you know, uh, like uh, reducing the coal, you know, introducing more gas, things like that, yeah. John, what do you make of those differences? You know, I hear the criticism often mm -hmm. of uh, the America First policy. Mm -hmm. I think it's perfectly natural for any leader of any government, especially that of a great power, to pursue that country's interests first. And I presume that Xi Jinping's policies are largely China first, mm -hmm. as Vladimir Putin's are Russia first. And then how do we work that prioritization with alliances and with friends and partners around the world? So that really should come as no surprise. And I think it's just a contrast to Obama who actually did not pursue an America first, but made everything a matter of the UN or our allies first, and that brought in a lot of criticism. On the climate agreement, I think President Trump's position is, we're going to do things that are good for the United States and good for the world, but we're going to do it from a more practical approach. The US has already reduced its emissions far more than almost any other European country Right. Without uh, abiding by the terms of the agreement, the Germans are actually increasing their emissions, even though their pronouncements and statements are that they're adhering to the agreement. And China doesn't have to do a single thing until 2030. So right. it's very much in China's interest and India's to continue to adhere to the agreement when there's nothing punitive for another 12 years. So what I'm hearing from you, John, is that we should listen to what President Trump is saying and then look at what he's doing. They're two different things. <laughs> People will disagree with him vehemently. That's yeah. clear here in the United States yeah. and around the world. Okay. But he pretty much says what he means. Edwin, go ahead. Yeah, basically, I think uh, this is uh, absolutely right. I think you are on this point. Uh, but one of the important things that came out from this uh, statement, although it's not totally new, the definition of China and Russia is anti-status quo powers as revisionist powers. I think this is a very important point at this stage, primarily because now it's also a recognition, not only because of the belief that both the, of these states, while the US still needs them, wants to cooperate with them, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in North Korea, but they are also posing a threat. And this, what's the, it's significant is that perhaps the US has come to the point of the recognition that the era of unilateralism is over. There is a new era coming, and we have to prepare for that era. Uh, the U.S. 
uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, emerged as the single, the only most uh, power in the world. Well, today the world has changed, and we see new powers emerging, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's Brazil, whether it's other countries, India. These are important countries that are going to play a role. Maybe they don't have the clout that the United States right. still has. Nevertheless, they are important players. And how the U.S. deals with them, how the U.S. works with them, is the U.S. able to cooperate while maintaining its interests? That's going to be the challenge before this administration okay. and the next one. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. We shall see what 2018 holds for us. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's all we have time for, but the conversation continues online. Chat with us about this or any other show on Twitter. We're at CGTN America, or visit us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash CGTN America. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.